right higher one i hope you can um, hear and see me well uh it's super nice to be presenting again here at plumpers thank you for having us uh, i'm Jakub. i'm a systems engineer at cloudflare and together with my colleague arthur we are gonna talk today about uh, rough edgers and bpf user experience so our agenda for today is straightforward first i'm gonna go over what kind of problems we human developers can run into when developing BPF-based apps. And then Arthur is going to take us on a tour of what can go wrong when machines are generating BPF code. Uh, first of all, a short disclaimer. Uh, please don't take this talk the wrong way. Uh, we think that BPF is great. It allowed us to build projects that wouldn't be possible without it. And we know that years of hard work went into getting the technology to this place. So uh, this talk is not about looking down on, on the problems and on the solutions, but rather uh, to share the know-how, because if we've run into some issues, it's likely that other users will run into them as well and also to, to trigger discussion about them. Maybe some of these uh, problems can be smoothened out without too much effort. And finally, to show where help is needed uh, because uh, someone actually needs to do the work. All right, uh, so here's our story. Uh, meet our novice developer, Buzz. And Buzz would like to build an application like Enstat that counts the packets going in into and out of a host. But instead, Buzz would like an instead that works per C group uh, because services are usually restricted to their own C group. Uh, so that little uh, project is going to be uh, our benchmark for user experience. And we're going to have to go through a bunch of steps to, to prototype it. Um, being adult and all, uh, anytime we run into problems, we're going to mark it with a set panda. Uh, before we start, uh, our test environments will be uh, Debian Bullseye sporting an LTS kernel, as well as uh, Fedora 34 that follows the stable kernel uh, 5.13 at the moment. Uh, we'll need mo one more thing to make the slides readable, uh, a small helper that will allow us to change the user and trace our capabilities easily. So anytime you see run as, just think uh, of the command as being run under a certain user with certain capabilities. And if you speak the systemd lingo, uh, that is uh, similar to running your service with user group and caps set. Right, let's go. Uh, first step, uh, first thing we need to do, we need to create a BPF map. Uh, why do we need a BPF map? Well, we need to count the packets. So let's create a really small map with just one entry with a 64-bit counter in it. Uh, we built our user space application, uh, try to run it, and we're actually not permitted to create a map. Uh, and that's kind of expected these days. Uh, distros by default uh, disable unprivileged BPF. And uh, to actually get anything done, you need to uh, at least cap BPF for your process. So, all right, we're just prototyping. Let's use sudo. Well, it turns out not so easy. Uh, and now to, to find out what's happening, uh, we'll have to uh, look under the hood, so to say. And uh, with Ftrace help, uh, look what's happening in the BPF syscall. And we see that we go, we get as far as BPF map charge in it. Uh, what happens there in LTS kernels, uh, just before we uh, start the teardown, we see that we uh, check uh, our allocations against the locked memory limit. So question is, are we hitting that? Well, first we need to know what actually the limit is set to. And uh, the default uh, differs from distro to distro, but it's, uh, we can check it pretty easily. A harder question, though, is uh, what is the current usage? I mean, we need to know that if we are over the limit. And here we'll uh, have to resort to some more tracing to actually dig out the current usage uh, from the work from the current task object down to the user that owns that task. And in this case, yeah, that's it. We are we are slightly over the limit. 
but why are we over the limit though? We, we haven't created anything yet. Well, it turns out that the allocations are tracked by, uh, per user, but you get a false sense that the limit is set per task. And what is more, the quota there is shared between all the maps, but also between the XDP sockets, IORURing network applications that use zero copy and perf, as long as they are running under the same user. So that's a bit uh, confusing. Uh, right, what's the solution for that? Well, we can just remove the limit completely um, and trust our application. And that is what BPF tool map create uh, does. If we follow that approach, yeah, we can create the map, no problems. But if we want to still restrict our application, perhaps there's a better solution. And uh, turns out we can use just a dedicated uh, user for our uh, BPF uh, program. Uh, because if we if we uh, use a fresh user, boss, for our project and check the current log number usage, well, we start at zero as expected. So there we go. Uh, we created a BPF map. We need to use a dedicated user and cap BPF to do it. And just a quick note that things have changed uh, uh, since 5.11, and now map allocations are charged against memory C group limit. Right, we have a place to count our packets. Now we gotta load the program that will actually do it. So here's our program. It's, it's really straightforward. It gets a pointer to a, an entry in the map and uh, it will just bump the counter every time a packet comes into one of the processes in the C group. Uh, we build it, we try to load it, and we get an error that is really, really strange. I, I don't know what's going on here. And I know it's not memlog because I've done this test on 5.13. So if we trace it, uh, it doesn't catch an, any more clearer. I mean, it looks like the BPF syscall is not supported, which is not the case. So once again, we got to go deeper and have trace what is going on. Uh, this time the output is much longer, but if we follow through, we can see that we get as far as something called BPF JIT charged mod man before all the teardown happens and we start freeing objects. And what happens in BPF JIT charge mod mem, we check if we are not over the BPF JIT memory limit. So maybe that's that. Uh, but what is the limit set to? Uh, well, we have syscuttle to check that. And in this case, I've artificially lowered this limit to one megabyte. The default is much higher. Uh, once we know what the limit is, we need to know what the current usage is. And here, unfortunately, it's not exposed anywhere. We have to turn to tracing again to dig out the value of a kernel global. And yeah, we are over the limit. Uh, but why are we over the limit? Well, here's what I done uh, for this test. I just uh, added a bunch of IP tables rules that use BPF match extension. So what do IP tables rules have to do with our BPF JIT programs? Well, it turns out that all kinds of BPF programs are charged against uh, the JIT memory limit. That includes the programs you load, as usual with uh, BPF syscall, as well as seccom programs, which automatically get translated from CBPF to BPF, and the IP tables rules that use the BPF map extension, match extension, sorry. Uh, what is perhaps more scary is that the limit is not per network namespace. But let's assume we've bound the limit and managed to load our program. Now we need to create a BPF link for it. Uh, why do we need a BPF link? Well, to attach our program to C group. We would like to attach it, but not the old way where a BPF program is attached directly to C group. This is what BPF C group attach uses because that's a discouraged practice. You can end up with an abandoned BPF program. Well, perhaps that applies more to trace, trace, trace points, but nevertheless, uh, newer types of programs don't even support this uh, uh, way of attaching. So we're going to go with BPF link. What is a BPF link? Well, it's an object that holds a ref to a BPF program. It knows to which entity this program is being attached. 
being uh, the C group, a network namespace, or a train spot. User space get a, gets a file descriptor as a handle to, to our link. And the idea is that uh, once the last file descriptor for the link gets closed, the program gets automatically detached and destroyed if there are no more references to it. So we want to create a BPF link, but uh, here is the problem. BPF tool won't help us there. We got to write a custom tool to do it. It's not super. Uh, it's not super difficult, but that's a bump in the road for the user. But let's let's assume we've uh, written our tool, we've loaded the program, we've attached it, and now we want we want it to keep it running. So we need to pin it somewhere so it persists. And the first question we face: Where do we pin it? Well, the default BPFFS instance that we have mounted on our machines is not actually only accessible to root, and that's because uh, that's how systemd sets it up. And my colleague Lawrence asked about it on the mailing list, and the guidance on best practice uh, that we received was that uh, we should have a BPFFS instance dedicated for your service or your user. So let's just just try to do that and mount uh, an FS, BPFFS for our user bus. Well, if we, if we attempt that, uh, we'll find out that uh, the initial owner of the FS is not right, because it seems the BPF file system doesn't understand the options that uh, allow you to set the initial ownership like TAMPFS does. But that's not a huge issue. We can just uh, adjust it with change on, right? Uh, except if you're using systemd mounts, then uh, systemd doesn't allow you to change the ownership after mounting a file system, and it turns into a little bit of a mess. But we've done it, we've set everything up. Uh, our program is attached. Now uh, let's see how we can inspect the attached program. Uh, why would we want to inspect the attached program? Well, perhaps we want to find out which maps it is using, or maybe read some of the program info, like it's tag to check if the correct version is loaded. Uh, so uh, with BPF tool, we can uh, inspect the attached link and we can see which program the link references, in this case, program ID 256. Uh, but if we try to inspect the program by the ID we found, that wouldn't be permitted for us. Uh, and here the troubleshooting is, is, is quite easy. We uh, just uh, got to look what uh, BPF Pro get FD by ID is doing, and we quickly find out that uh, unfortunately it's limited to users running with Capsys admin. All right, uh, that's fine. Let's use sudo so we have Capsys admin to uh, inspect our program. And uh, here's an interesting thing the kernel knows we have created the program. Uh, but we're not able to get uh, access to it without sysadmin. So what's the workaround in this case? Well, uh, in addition to pinning the link, you need to pin the procs or maps so that you can later query them. Okay, we have everything set up. The program is attached, the objects are pinned. Now we want to read the useful stats that we're collecting from a user space map, from a user space. Uh, and actually, we don't want to read them ourselves. We want a metric scraper that is running uh, with different credentials to do it. So first thing we need to do, we need to make the map readable to uh, anyone. Uh, please know that that's not the best security practice because you still can still modify the map from the BPF uh, context. Uh, but we're going to go with it. We also need to make the dedicated BPFFS instance accessible to anyone. Once we've done that, we can simulate what the scraper will be doing by uh, running BPF uh, tool map dump uh, as the scraper. And surprise, well, it's uh, not allowed to dump the map. Why is it failing? Well, it can't get an FD for the map. Uh, so we have to trace again, and this time we um, get as far as inode permission. Uh, what do we do here uh, in inode permission? Well, we actually compare the access rights to the pinned uh, file against flags that we passed in file flags attribute in, in the BPF syscall. 
And unfortunately, the flags, if we don't set them, uh, are translated to read and write requests by default. And that is actually what BPF2 map dump is using. It's requesting read and write access by default, even though it probably doesn't need to. Um, not a problem though, we're just gonna write a custom dumper that, that shouldn't be too hard, right? Uh, except that it's a little hard uh, because libbpf doesn't allow you to set file flags. Uh, so you must call the BPF syscall directly and glibc doesn't wrap the BPF syscall. So you end up with uh, the snippet of low level code. All right, so after making our Panda set nine times by my count, we can test our program. We'll run ping in the background as a transient service and we can attach our packet counter to the C group created for that service. And as a scraper, using our custom uh, helper for dumping the map, read out the packet count. Right, and that's all from me. Uh, here are all the issues we've run into on the way, if you would like to discuss them uh, afterwards. Uh, the code uh, for everything I've shown him is on GitHub, but I encourage you strongly to try to build it yourself and try to troubleshoot the issues. And I'm happy to discuss uh, any of this after the talk. Now, in, uh, in the sake of staying in the time slot, I'm going to pass it on to my colleague Garter to talk a little bit about problems with auto-generating BPF. Thanks. Thanks, Jakob. Can I get access to the slides, please? I don't think I can move them. Ah, awesome. Thank you. So now on to auto-generate BPF and issues we have there. So for a bit of context, we mainly use this as part of our uh, distributed denial of service mitigation pipeline. So the basic idea is we just want to drop all the DOS packets. And so we have a separate mitigation system, and we're not going to cover that today. It's like an offline separate thing that generates classic BPF. And this is classic BPF in the sense of libpcap or TCP dump. And we push all these rules, which you can see right here, down to our servers. And the goal is that they just drop packets. So in this silly example, orange is all the attack packets, and only the blue nice safe packets make it through. And so we use classic BPF because it's super flexible. We have tons of sources to generate it. So the most common one, of course, being libpcap or TCP dump. But we also have custom generators that can match, for example, on DNS query host names and DNS packets, and also a bunch of just handwritten classic BPF assembly. And even cooler, we can run it in a bunch of places. So today, we run it in IP tables with XTBPF, like Jakob showed earlier. And we also run it in XTP with CBPFC. And this is a little tool to compile classic BPF to C. And then we can compile the C to eBPF with Clang. And this is kind of how it ends up looking. So we have all of our classic BPF rules. And so typically, we have hundreds of these rules at the same time. And so at the same time, we end up with hundreds of IP tables rules. But we don't really want to have hundreds of uh, XTP programs around. So we compile all these down to one C file and then build that with Clang and load it as XTP into the kernel. What could go wrong? Well, it turns out a lot goes wrong. Uh, we see two main different kinds of failures. The first one is eBPF that we've generated that is rejected by the kernel, uh, by the verifier. And this is even ignoring kind of intrinsic limits like the maximum stack size or the maximum number of instructions. And this, these general problems are the same that you have when handwriting BPF. There's just no human to go fix the problems in between. So the classic ones are like packet accesses and division by zero, but we've mostly figured those out. Uh, but this still remains the hardest part for us, uh, especially with all of our classic BPF rules combined into like one C file. Clang loves to do all kinds of dark magic to and crazy optimizations that tend to break things. Uh, and the failure mode isn't great. When, the, when this happens, it kind of freezes our whole DOS mitigation pipeline, so we can't add or remove rules anymore. Uh, and the second kind of issue we've seen before is incorrect behavior. And this is just means that we, we generated eBPF that passed the kernel verifier but it just doesn't do the right thing. So either we drop the wrong packets or we don't drop anything at all. Uh, and what sucks here, of course, is that it's hard to notice and these issues are really hard to debug. So it's kind of just occasional packets randomly go missing. So of course, BPF is good for testing and we have lots of unit tests to try and fix these problems. Uh, so we have unit tests pretty much for every known classic BPF rule we have. And uh, we can test this pretty easily by compiling them. So here with our usual pipeline, so we take this VPF convert it to C, and then compile that to VPF. 
and then we can just load it into the kernel. And when I say proc test run here, I'm kind of conflating it with loading the program at the same time. Uh, and so we can check to make sure the verifier accepts the program and that loading is happy. And then of course we can use proc test run where you get to feed a specially crafted input packet through a, a BPF program, get the result to make sure it matches. But the problem is that this can only cover so much. Uh, all our rules are parametric. So we can have the same rule, but for different IPs, different ports. And we have hundreds, of, hundreds and hundreds of rules and we can have handwritten BPF and combining all this, it's just not feasible to write a test for everything. And unfortunately, we still see failures in production. And so the idea was to try start testing what unknown filters we haven't seen yet. So of course, we can just generate some random CVPF instructions and we can load them the same way with BPF clock load. But how do we know if that's valid? How do we know if it should load? And it's the same problem with correctness. Of course, we can load a random program uh, we can run a packet, a random packet through the random program, but how do we know if it should match or not? And thankfully, this is where the uh, flexibility of classic VPF comes into its own. Of course, there's a reference implementation. So classic VPF is also used for socket filters. And so we can attach our original classic VPF input program as a socket filter on a Unix socket and use that to figure out what our random program with our random packet should do. So if we can attach the socket filter, then our compiled program should load. And if the socket filter drops the packet, then so should our program. And this ends up looking like this. So we have here just kind of a random source of classic BPF. And it, so it generates classic BPF in a packet. And the packet goes through the reference source. And it tells us if this filter is actually valid and if the random packet should match it. And then here we can test our own implementation and see if uh, we also think it's valid or it also matches. And anytime these disagree, of course, that's a problem. But part of the problem is that it's hard to exhaustively explore all the possibilities here. We're just kind of generating random input and seeing what sticks at the wall. It'd be cool if we could kind of exhaustively search the space. And so it turns out we're just one step away from fuzzing. And the idea with fuzzing is that we can have a fuzzer here that starts off with an initial corpus or kind of sample classic BPF programs, loads them and runs them through our normal test pipeline, so CBPFC and at the same time instruments it to get information about which program counters and which code paths were actually covered by this. And so then when it's making random changes to this corpus, it can figure out which random changes are interesting and yielded more code coverage and we should keep and which ones did nothing where we changed something random, but it turns out that was just like changing load one to load two and it didn't actually make any changes. So nothing would ever break. And so this is kind of what it's ended up looking like. So it's the same thing as before, except now that we have GoFuzz, and this is a, a standard-ish uh, Golang tool for fuzzing Golang libraries. And it generates both the classic BPF and the packet, so it's kind of almost like two-dimensional fuzzing. Uh, and this is important because it means it's fully deterministic, and that when we have crashes, we kind of have the whole sets of input preserved as one thing. And, of course, we get CBPFC is instrumented, and we get coverage back into GoFuzz. And so this is cool, and it works, but it was really slow. And the time to first bug was in days. And that seems typical, I guess, when you look online at other fuzzing examples, but we know there's a lot of low hanging fruit here. And so a big part of the problem, I think, is that we don't have uh, code coverage for the most interesting bits. So we can cover an instrument, our own little compiler, but there's only so many code paths there, it's not that complicated. Um, but what we don't have coverage for is like the BPF VM, the BPF verifier, and the same things on the socket filter. So whatever converts it to eBPF. And so this is where KPOL comes in, which actually it turns out is a way to just collect kernel code coverage. Uh, and we can just read uh, covered PCs from user space for the current thread. And it's really easy to enable and disable. So you can collect information for just the syscalls you want to you collect for. And this is a power syscaller. Now, unfortunately, there's no easy way to hook this extra coverage information back into GoFuzz that I could find. But it's OK, because we can use libfuzzer, which is also what syscaller uses. And that's super flexible and lets you specify tons of additional coverage sources. And the cool part here is that we can end up with one fuzzing engine here that still does the same as before, so it generates the classic VPF and the packet and runs it through the whole pipeline. But now it gets coverage from converting the classic VPF to C, from loading and running the eBPF program, and from loading and running the socket filter. So it gets covered for pretty much everything except for Clang. And this is a lot better and it's really cool because we have like a combined fuzzer with user space and kernel space coverage. And in this case, the time to first bug was more on the order of minutes than days. I mean, not single minutes, but like 10 minutes or so. And it's found some cool uh, bugs. So one of those is that we try to 
insert as few packet bounds checks as we can because it really adds up to a lot of instructions. And in some subtle cases, we just kind of forgot to add some. Uh, and it turns out we also didn't check for overflows. So the verifier enforces that offsets that we add to packet pointers need to be less than 16 bits so they don't overflow. And we didn't check that. And that requires runtime checks. Uh, yeah, so we found lots of these cool bugs, but we also found a bunch of bugs that we, well, not a bunch, but a few bugs that we really don't really know what to do about. Uh, so one of these is uh, Clang optimizing out packet bounds. So we write code that has a packet bound stack, and then Clang just gets rid of it or mangles it. So here's a small challenge. Try to read the last byte of a packet, just in C, with no ASM hacks. And so this is, I think, what it would look like in XDP. So we just load you know, the normal data, data endpointers from the XDP metadata, metadata figure out what the size is, and then do a bounce check. But of course, this bounce check is kind of nonsensical because it's computed based off of data and data n, so this is never going to be true. And then finally, just read the last byte. Now, of course, this doesn't work. Uh, Clang is both really smart and kind of silly. So it's really smart in that Clang figures out that we're just trying to read the last byte of a packet, even though we never, use, we never read from data n. And it only loads data n. So Clang doesn't even load the data pointer from the XDP struct. And it literally just reads the last byte. But of course, the packet bounds check becomes quite silly, r1 greater than r1, which is really kind of nonsensical. Uh, and yeah, it's not quite clear what, we, what exactly we should do about this. Um, should we have a magic annotation to help Clang not optimize out bounds checks? It seems like that could help. But then again, lots of these bounds checks can usually be optimized and removed. And that does help sometimes with code sizes. A similar thing we found is register mirroring. This is, well, this is what I'm calling it. I don't think this is an official name. Uh, but the idea is that Clang takes two registers that are copies of each other and applies the same operation independently twice. And then Clang knows they're the same value, but the, ver the verifier does not. So if we start off here, R3 is just some random packet data that's been loaded. Uh, and the, we copy it into R4. So now these two registers have the same value. We do some bit shifts on this one to trunk, like, uh, make sure it's 32 bits. And then here, we do our overflow check. And we do this on the copy that's had the, uh, the, the, the bit shifting done. And so we can see that as soon as we do the bit shifting, of course, the verifier gives it a new ID, starts checking the max value. Our, overlo our overflow check works, and we get a sensible max value that's less than 2 to the 16. Great so far. But then when we're doing the packet load, Clang uses the original register, R3 from up here, does the same operations to it. So at which point, it has the same value as the copy we've made here that we have bounce checked. But of course, the verifier doesn't know that and still thinks it has a humongous Umax value and packet accesses don't work. And so in this case, somehow Clang is kind of correct. It's like semantically, these registers do have the same value. But how can the verifier figure that out? Uh, that seems to me, innocently, like a really hard problem to fix in the verifier of tracking which registers have the same values based on what operations are done. Uh, and maybe there are some magic CCASs or things we can do to this, but I couldn't figure anything out to, to fix this. And so uh, with these bugs, we started thinking about, is a world without claim better for us when we generate EVPF? And could we generate EVPF directly ourselves? If we do it ourselves, we can make sure that we're never going to optimize out of balance check or mirror or register or put a packet pointer on the stack. And this is something we've had problems with before, packet pointers on stacks and the verifier not tracking all the attributes. But I wasn't able to reproduce it the other day. So maybe that's just magically fixed. If so, thank you. Uh, and we also thought that we might still be able to have our cake and eat it because we can hand write some of our C code and then link it to the auto generated BPF and kind of keep it up. And so this is supported today in our CVPFC library. It can also generate directly EVPF. And we test it and fuzz it the same way as we do the, the C backend that we talked about before. But unfortunately, this didn't turn out to be a kind of universal solution. So uh, here's another example where <coughs> uh, the, there's more space, so we have more context. So the, we load. So R2 is just the packet pointer. And we load one byte from the packet, fair enough. And we've already done the bounce checks and everything here before, so this is allowed. And of course, we're loading a single byte, so the verifier decides that the Umax value is 255. Fair enough. And then we do something a bit nonsensical here. We compare it to 512. So of course, a single byte is always going to be less than 512. But in this case, if the byte is less than 512, we uh, jump somewhere else. And so if we continue down this branch, 
the, the byte has to be greater than 512. And to its credit, the verifier tracks this. The minimum value is now 512, and the max value is 255. But of course, this doesn't make much sense. And as soon as we try to add this offset onto a packet <coughs> to dereference it, uh, it just becomes invalid, and the verifier rejects it. Now, of course, this code is nonsensical. It kind of just doesn't make sense. And also, interestingly, it doesn't happen with Clang. Clang never generates, as far as I can tell, stuff like this, because it's also smarter and tracks the values of variables and know that a single byte will always be less than 512. So this only happens when we're compiling classic BPF directly to eBPF. But in other ways, this seems kind of like a legal, like an allowed thing. In any other language, if we write normal C code, this would be dead code, but it would be still allowed. And so should we fix the verifier to allow this? Should we, can we somehow, it seems like the verifier has enough information to know this is dead code. Should it just ignore it? Or should we deal with it in user space? Uh, and that seems like a harder problem because it means we'd have to go re-implement all of kind of the, the, var the variable range tracking to know the umax and umin all in our library um, on top of what the verifier is already doing. And so yeah, that's it for all the bugs. We, fuzzing isn't perfect yet. Right now we do have lots of problems. One of them is that it's hard to suppress errors. So even with the program counters and the coverage, the, the fuzzing does tend to generate the same error over and over again. Uh, and I think the typical way this is suppressed and like er errors are like uh, future errors that are the same are ignored is based on like matching the error string or the output of the program. Um, but of course the verifier output changes with all the instructions, so that's kind of hard to do. Um, and we've also gotten to the point where there's just so many errors when fuzzing the C back in with Clang that we've kind of stopped. Um, but yeah, it seems like it would be cool if maybe we could suppress errors based on the program counter somehow. It doesn't seem like this is something libfuzzer supports. Maybe we could go uh, do it ourselves. Uh, we're also using KCOF with the BPF JIT and the interpreter. And I played with both and we get similar results, but it's not quite clear if one is better than the other or if there really is a, kind of a meaningful difference. And so this run for this was done with Clang 13. Well, that's what I put on the slide, but I realized that it's actually Clang 11, so this is wrong. Ignore it. And on an LTS kernel, and the test cases are on GitHub. And the a PR to implement all the fuzzing I've just talked about isn't yet up, but hopefully it will be in the next few days. It's a few loose ends to wrap up. And that's it. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks so much for your uh, presentation. Um, now opening up for questions, if anyone, ah, I see John raised his hand, please pick up. Um, yeah, I had uh, just one of the bugs you were pointing out looked like a bit shifting bug, right, I think. Um, I, I, you went a little bit faster than I could follow, I think it was on like 74 or 75, but um, it looked like you weren't using ALU32, and I think a lot of that is the compiler trying to zero the upper 32 bits, um, which it which it has to do because it's C, and it doesn't know you know it has to zero the upper 32 bits. Um, I think you will fix those if you use ALU32 and a new Clang, like like Clang latest. Okay, thanks. So I'll, I'll definitely give that a go. I yeah. Good. I was trying to find. I think. I've seen this before with additions as well, where Clang takes a register and adds the same constant to like two different copies, but I couldn't find it anymore. So maybe I was just uh, dreaming. Yeah, so, I would try the latest Clang for some of that stuff. I think there may have been a follow-up comment from Lawrence. Yeah, hello. Uh, uh, some time ago, I tried enabling LU32. I'm not sure how well that went. Uh, this, uh, <laughs> yeah, I should have sent something to the mail list. I forgot about it. Sorry. Um, there was something where you kind of need to make sure that certain variables stay 64-bit. Uh, otherwise, you lose certain bounds, at least on the kernel that we use. So. So it's a bit hard to keep it straight what's been fixed upstream and what we have because all of our production is uh, basically always on LTS. Uh, that's a good suggestion, John. Thank you. So there's a question from, from Toki. Please go ahead. Yeah, I, I think I've run into the um, register mirroring thing with manually written C code as well at some point. So. Having some kind of 
general solution for that would be awesome because it's really annoying to debug. Um, I, I had another question. So um, on the CBPF to eBPF thing, it seems to me that this is a sort of generally useful thing to have, right? Uh, the ability to match unpacked metadata and, and use all the CBPF generators, the PCAP and so on. And since we already have an execution engine for it in the kernel, would it make sense to be able to just hook into this from eBPF, like a helper that you can load the CBPF bytecode separately and the kernel will take sh make sure that um, the semantics match and you can just like BPF call into something that will give you a match or didn't match? That's definitely a really interesting idea. I, I never thought about that. Um, yeah, I guess that would that would work too. That'd be kind of cool. I yeah. yeah, that sounded really interesting. Something to look into for sure. All right, there's a question from Andre. It's more like a comments, uh, mostly about the second part because I already forgot the first part of the talk. Can you go back like a few slides? So on the on the register mirroring, like Yong Kong and Alexei could correct me. I think we try to fix that issue in latest Clank. So like always try latest Clank. Uh, we try to minimize at least like that. But uh, this problem with uh, data and plus size and the compiler optimizing this, right? We've had some success using a very simple macro, which I'll uh, paste in the chat. Like call, I called it barrier wire. Like you can find it in self test. It essentially makes a variable sort of unknown to the compiler. So it should avoid optimizing the size check. So try that. So in, insert this barrier wire war after you calculate size. So between size and between doing the if, that should help. And that should help actually with, with some other cases. So for example, like in this case, you say that U64 uh, casting didn't help you, right? It's because Clang is so smart that it tries to delay this U64 cast as long as possible. Sometimes it just avoids it when it can prove that, you know, like it doesn't matter and all that stuff. So this barrier, barrier war also helps in, in those cases because you just say like, Compiler, don't assume anything you know about the variable, like treat like it, it was rewritten essentially. That's what the assembler says. Like it's no op, but it says that, you know, variable comes in through the register, comes out, and like, you know, because it's assembler, compiler cannot assume anything. There was something else. Can you go back like a few slides? I, uh, while I'm. Uh, before, before we go to the other slide, I will just have a quick comment on this one. Uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, I will second uh, John's suggestion of trying MCPU v3 and which is turns on the suited bit register mode and it's actually default in the clank i forgot since which version uh, because in general it produces better code which not just better code it's shorter code and it performs better in most of the cases we've tested i forgot the exact percentage gain uh, and what we found that on most of the tests it gives uh, better verification results so the code was the latest with MCPU v3 and LU32 has a much higher chance to pass through the through the verifier. Then uh, regarding all of this, what you call register mirroring, there was actually we identified about five different cases within optimizations within Clang uh, that was causing this uh, well optimizations that are unfriendly to the verifier. And we didn't quite disable them because we cannot really disable optimizations in general in Clang. So what we did, we introduced um, special built-ins and uh, passes inside the verifier where certain parts, let's say, of the optimizations get like uh, becomes somewhat invisible to the uh, backend and this uh, parts of the optimizations no longer happening so and this is all again i don't remember which clank version it all went in but it's relatively recent uh recent meaning like around nine months maybe six months six months or so ago so if you are on clank 11 yeah that's definitely would be way too old for all of this to happen to to be observed Oh, okay. Great, thank you. Yeah, I'll definitely try with a, a more recent Clang and MCPU v3. That'll be interesting. Yeah, because for, for the direct EBPF, we use AU32, and that does work really well.
So if Sorry. I might, like, I, I did actually have the question. Uh, you, you were mentioning like that you are uh, linking the handwritten C uh, BPF code to the auto-generated C code. Like, how, how do you do that? And whether you tried the libbpf static linker for that? Because that seems to be a good case for that. Uh, no, I haven't tried the libbpf static linker. We use, uh, everything is Go, so we use the Cilium eBPF library. And as far as I know, there's no support for that yet there. And right now, when I say linking, we're just kind of embedding it almost. Uh, so we're like rewriting, like I have a hacked up version that just rewrites the ELF to insert the instructions in the right place. Uh, but hopefully at some point we can move to a, a nicer API. Okay, I was imagining that you would produce like a separate ELF file just with like your auto-generated code and then actually link it to another uh, ELF file generated by client. But yeah, like for Go, it probably won't work. All right. I had one more uh, thought maybe like for the register mirroring. I think like, um... If we would implement that in the verifier, I'm not sure, but my assumption would be like it would probably really hurt path pruning uh, potentially quite badly. Um, my assumption, or I mean, maybe it would just be like a naive uh, implementation, but you would probably have to mark all the registers and whenever they change one way or another, you would have to add a, like a new ID to them uh, so that you get, so that you don't propagate information to those that don't have the same ID, for example. Um, but maybe that's a better option. I, I don't know, but I think yeah. I think you and Quang already did that for simple case where the registers are just copied and not modified. But very often Clank, like in my practice, right? Clank would copy mm -hmm. the register, will decrement one of them by one and then assume that the relation between them is like plus minus one. And that's what's hard to track. So like I think we in latest uh, verifiers, we do track when the registers stay exactly the same until they are modified. Uh, that's what I think you and like added that to verifier. But. I don't know, but like so, when uh, you actually go uh, and modify plus minus so this one, is then Andy, it's you're talking about this, yeah, the uh, ranges. It's it's part of the uh, common sub expression stuff. Uh, it's not the full optimization pieces right. of it, but responsible for it. And yes, this was addressed in the latest LVM. So just in general, like comment. So thanks, uh, folks, a lot for the for the feedback. Like absolutely acknowledge all of the issues you mentioned. They are real, no doubt. And with the environment that you described, this version of the client, this version of the kernel, absolutely the users will hit it. And that's a, a usability constraints and certainly makes for the poor user experience. This is understood. And I think everyone is working hard to fix those. This is highest priority in general, like improve the user experience. But please try the latest kernel and the latest clang because there is constantly like effort to improve stuff. So this feedback would be more valuable if, like you say, well, we've tried on the latest clang and latest kernel and we steal this issue. Then it would be like very actionable. Like from this, it's hard to make step forward from here, like from this register meeting. Well, is it a real issue now? We believe we fixed it all from what we've seen. If you still see it, please try with the latest clank, latest kernel, and if it's still there, we'll be happy to like go back and see whether we missed anything. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I'll definitely give it a go with the latest kernel and the, like, late nightly, like BPF next and uh, like latest claim for sure and report back if you find anything. Uh, could you go back to all the sad pandas? <laughs> because I feel like we should also talk about those a little bit. It's it's light 54, uh, do, do you want to, you can probably select it directly from. Meanwhile, uh, there was a comment from Paul uh, that I can just uh, uh, read for the audience. Uh, so he mentioned we use uh, ALU uh, 32 attribute for, for LVM in Cilium to remove those shifts, but only on the latest kernels because Verify had some issues in all the kernels. And with MCPU v3, it also helps for verifier complexity and the number of instructions. Yeah. Um, cool. So, yeah, I, I think like it. It seems like a lot of these are potentially also fixable from the kernel side. Um, did you? Um, can can we expect some of those as patches from you? Or <laughs> so I'm I'm. I'm 
like just to give an example of like for the file system that you mentioned where you um need the user and, and group id as as, as owners uh, have, have you looked into into that it should, maybe it's trivial to do um what are your thoughts here <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, we'll try to contribute as time allows, uh, but also I wanted to list the issues because sometimes people are looking for, you know, projects to get involved uh, and uh, they perhaps don't know where they should get started. And uh, like you mentioned, some of these issues seem easily fixable. Some of them are in the user space and libbpf. That would be a great place to start contributing. Uh, yeah, but uh, we want to smoothen out the user experience as well, because that would uh, also translate into our um, s our configuration and production. That would be easier to maintain. Yeah, definitely makes sense. I mean, absolutely. Uh, thanks for bringing all these up. I was wondering, like, for the like, given we removed the R limit uh, some time ago that you mentioned, do you have any experience now that that, that it's moved over to the uh, memory C groups. Um, did, did did you run into anything on on that in production or, yeah? So uh, we are uh, still uh, waiting to take benefit of that because uh, we run LTS, so uh, all our prod is still on five ten at this moment. And uh, yeah, ask me again, uh, beginning beginning of next year. I have a follow-up question because I don't understand like the real-world real uh, implications. Like, what if you actually increase this R limit to infinity, like for for your user? Like, what what bad would happen? Uh, and the context for this is that uh, I thought about like doing this by default in like libpf 1.0 mode uh, for everyone. Like, if so, if the kernel is old, then just like bump the R limit to infinity because it's like the constant pain and everyone is like just forgetting about this. But I'm wondering like what will be the downsides of doing that? Because I think in practice, a lot of applications that I saw actually do the infinity and forget about this. But I don't know, it seems like you are very cautious about this. So I wonder what's the downsides. Yeah, so I think when I was testing it, uh, if you just uh, constantly uh, try to allocate uh, the OM killer will, try, will kill you at some point, uh, which is not a huge problem, but uh, that's definitely something that we uh, try to avoid uh, popping up in, in production uh, and causing alerts. So that's more like a security guard that we want to have uh, for, for any service that your allocations don't go out of uh, what you expect them to be. Uh, so it's just in case, just a precaution. And, and also, I guess, like, I guess library, uh, like Go li sorry, uh, if like DBPF or Go library, right? Like would just bump it to infinity, what would go wrong? Like, would it be that bad? Because like, I can find many other ways how the user space application can exhaust like whatever resource in the kernel, right? So, this this specific R limit seems to be causing more more pain than actually benefits. Right, right. So I just remember what was our other concern. So, to bump uh, the limit, you need uh, Capsis resource, right? That allows you to change uh, other resource limit as well. So if possible, we uh, try to uh, run with uh, least possible privileges. So that's uh, uh, that's a pain point there. Uh, but I, I don't I don't know and I don't remember if you can uh, affect our workloads by just uh, going wild and allocating as much uh, memory for BPF maps as as you possibly can with a limit set to infinity. Yeah, and also it's uh, fair to say that this was fixed. So this is just mm, something uh, to know of until uh, you phase out uh, the LTS kernel and uh, soon it will no longer be an issue, at least for us. I think in terms of stuff that we would work on, I think one thing that's kind of tiny, and we've, we've been discussing this, Daniel, is kind of at least make this JIT, JIT limit better discoverable, I guess, and being able to read out what's the current value, stuff like that. I still think it's 
well, we learned about it last week. <laughs> We're still kind of trying to work through the implications. Yeah. I think it's it's kind of worrying, to be honest, because uh, we have many different kind of teams writing stuff. Um, but I have absolutely no idea how to fix it, right? So I think the best we can do is, okay. is put it up for discussion. Um, another thing yeah, that no. is, sorry, yeah. No, no, go ahead. Like we, we have, we actually, sorry, actually we have to switch now because it's already 40. Okay. Uh, we probably need to move this <laughs> or like continue to discuss on the mailing list. Um, but uh, definitely good that you brought this up. Okay, so thanks again for your, presentation. It was very interesting and good discussions. Um, so the next one.